Uh, friends, uh, I, I hope you are indeed uh, sitting there wondering, hang on, this guy can't get up and preach yet. We haven't read the Bible. Exactly. That's right. Uh, we're going to read the Bible. Don't worry. Uh, we're just going to do it a little bit differently this morning. Um, some Bible readers will jump up at appropriate times. Um, we're, uh, we're also going to pray. Uh, what we've just sung, we, we sang that, uh, that we kind of sang a prayer that God would glorify himself through us. And let's pray that he glorifies himself through what we're about to do now. Let's pray. Father God, indeed, we ask you to glorify yourself uh, through uh, us this morning, through the words that we say, through the way that we interact with each other, through the way that we respond to your word. Uh, glorify yourself through my words uh, as I seek to uh, proclaim yours. Uh, glorify yourself, Father, as we uh, gaze upon the wonder of what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, how does it feel when the idiots are in charge? I don't know if there was any connection to what Howard was saying about staff team before. Um, but how does it feel when the idiots are in charge? When you can see the foolishness of people in power and you see how their foolishness affects others. It causes pain, it causes distress, it, it, uh, it causes death and destruction. And it seems like there is not a darn thing that you can do about it. The world that we are entering into in this book of Esther is a world of powerful fools. It's set in a time when God's people, Israel, were in exile and they'd been deported from their homeland in Judah. Jerusalem, their city, was gone uh, and the land was far away. Babylon had long defeated them, destroyed their temple and their city. Time had marched on and even Babylon could not resist the, uh, the fate of time and the Babylonians had fallen to the Persian Empire and Xerxes, the present king, was hard at work displaying his power to the world. The book of Esther opens with an extravagant, an extravagant scene of exhibitionism. For 180 days, Xerxes had been displaying his power and his wealth. Perhaps it involved a royal tour around his 127 provinces. It certainly involved a whole load of wine. But men and wine and egos are a dangerous mix. And when Xerxes has had a skin full, it's skin that is on his mind. And he commands his assistants to bring out his well, as we're told, shapely and beautiful wife. He wants to show her off to his friends and his officials. There are no prizes for imagining what is going to happen. But Xerxes' wife ought to get a prize for her bravery. She has her hashtag me too moment and refuses to come. Xerxes is furious, burning with anger. For all his power and strength, though, it's his ego that's exposed as thoroughly weak. Now, this is a dangerous situation, his advisers tell him. If word gets out that the queen you know, has done such a thing, all hell will break loose. Men in all the provinces will have to make their own sandwiches and fetch their own slippers or something like that. Quick, the advisers instruct. Issue decrees and laws. The, women's, the women must obey their husbands and a new queen must, found, must be found. Xerxes is clearly a narcissist and a megalomaniac. When Xerxes gets around to the task of finding a new wife, the advice from his advisors is to gather in the beautiful women from all his provinces. And that is where we meet Esther. Esther is the adopted daughter of her uncle Mordecai. They were Jews, their families long deported from Judea. How they ended up in, in Susa, in Persia, is a long story. A story told across the pages of the Old Testament. But for Mordecai and Esther, it's almost immaterial. These are ordinary people caught up in the to and fro of kingdoms. 
But although Esther is ordinary, she is by no means plain. The narrator stresses one thing to us about Esther. She was a looker. She had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Now, what would you expect from a story with a woman-hungry, megalomaniac, narcissistic king and a pretty young girl? Well, Bronwyn's going to come and give us the first of our readings this morning. All right, let's read together Esther chapter 2, starting at verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favour. Immediately, he provided her with, her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Well, Esther was indeed a pretty young thing. But that's not my description. That's the way the women are treated in Persia. They are things, things to be made worthy of Xerxes. Only after a full year of beautification are they worthy to go and see the king. Each night, a new girl, a new flavor from another province for Xerxes to taste. And when he is done with them, then they went into his reserve harem, waiting for him to call back. Makes you want to vomit in your mouth a little. Finally, Esther gets her turn and she is taken to the palace. The king not only approves of Esther, but falls in love with her. The uncomfortable fact of the story, though, well, is that Esther outperforms the other virgins. We're not told how, but perhaps if you still have the foul taste of bile in your throat, then that should be enough for you to work it out. You won't find this part in the children's Bibles. Uh, another party is held. Esther is proclaimed queen. But who she really is, a Jew, the adopted daughter of Mordecai, that's a secret for another day. Now, as you read the story at this point, uh, you, you're, you're meant to wonder, what is all this for? What is happening here? There are no tactics played or moves made to, to make whatever happens, happens. It, it just seems to happen. Esther, the girl from nowhere, has been carried along all the way to the throne. Orphan, adopted and nubile, but now the queen of Persia. And things just happen for her uncle Mordecai too. He happens to be in the right place at the right time to hear the, of a, a plot to assassinate the king. And he passes off the intelligence to Esther. She tells King Xerxes and the plot is put down. The, ex, the conspirators are executed. It's all written down in the daily records of the king's court. And yet Mordecai gets forgotten. And again, you're left to wonder, why did that just happen? Is this story just documenting how life is? You know, you win some, you lose some, stuff happens, you play your part, you have no control. Well, don't worry, more of this sort of thing happened. The king honours someone else, not Mordecai. Haman, the Agite, is honoured. Again, there is no reason given. It just happens. Haman is made second in command of Xerxes' kingdom and everyone is meant to bow to him. And everyone does, except for the guy Mordecai. Maybe it was because Haman was honoured and Mordecai was not. Or maybe it was because Haman's background, he's an Agite, or Agagite, sorry. That means he's uh, a, a descendant of King Agag, the Amalekite king. Uh, so he's an Amalekite descendant, the ancient enemies of the Jews. We don't know, but Mordecai doesn't bow. And it sets off a situation of terror. Haman learns of Mordecai's refusal and his Jewish background and his anger is boundless. It's not enough just to kill Mordecai. No, he wants to wipe out the whole race. But Haman's rage is careful 
and suspic- uh, superstitious. He casts the lot, uh, rolls the dice, uh, and uh, he's trying to find out the right time for him to strike. The lot falls to the 12th month, the month of Adar. And so he goes to the king with a deceitful message about the Jews. They can't be trusted. They're different. Strange. They set themselves apart. They're not like us. They don't deserve to live. They need to go. Let me wipe them out for you. All of them. It takes surprisingly little effort to have Xerxes agree. He even hands Haman the power to write the law himself, a law of the Medes and the Persians, no less. It cannot be revoked. Every Jew, man, woman and child is to be killed on the 13th of the month of Adar. The law is published, the decrees are sent out, and again, the wine flows. And again, is this how life works? You do something good, save the king, it goes unrecognised. You do something foolish, refuse to bow to a stupid official, and you set off a course of destruction for your entire race. Is this how life and fate are worked out? Are we all just one roll of the dice away from life and death? Let's ask the story. Bronwyn's going to read to us from chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish... I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Thanks, Bronwyn. There's no doubt about the threat of this law, but there's plenty of doubt and uncertainty about what could be done. Esther had doubts about 
the safety of approaching the king. Mordecai had doubts about Esther's own survival if she didn't. But did you notice there was no doubt about something else? No doubt that whatever happens, deliverance will come. If not through Esther, then, as he said in verse 14 there, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place. What drives Mordecai to have such confidence in deliverance? Even while he is so distressed and in mourning, even while he was passed over by the king and faces a powerful enemy in Haman, what gives him confidence that the fate of the Jews is not total annihilation? Why does he think the dice will roll in the favour of the Jews, one way or another? As Mordecai, or, and as Mordecai mused, who knows? Maybe Esther's rise to queen is indeed for such a time as this. So Esther takes the lead here. She's, uh, she calls for fasting, and after three days of fasting, Esther begins making her move. She takes a risk of entering the king's presence, something that comes with the threat of death. But the king welcomes his queen and Esther invites Haman to come and dine with her. Feasting uh, seems to be, uh, feasting and, and wine, lots of wine, seems to be the language of the ruling Persian class. And so she lubricates the appetite of the king with wine and kindness. And Xerxes calls for her to give her request. But Esther says, no, not yet. Tomorrow, I'll ask. And so she books a second date. Now, why does she ask for a second? Why, why does she wait another day, uh, a second banquet? Why does she delay? Oh, I can't see an answer in the text. Is, is it just a Persian custom or a courtesy? Is it part of a, a bigger plan here? My guess, and it is just a guess, is that she has got no idea what to do. And she's hoping something will happen. Something always happens, just as it has been happening so far. And something does happen, only not what we want to happen. Haman passes Mordecai on a second time on his way home from dinner with Esther. And a second time, Mordecai refuses to honour Haman's rank. And so Haman refuses to wait any more. On the advice of his wife and friends who have no reason to doubt Haman's good fortune, everything's been going in his favour so far, Haman prepares for Mordecai's death with a giant pole erected outside his house and Mordecai will be impaled on it the next day. Now everything is set for a showdown. The tension of the story kind of wound up for us. Will Haman get Mordecai? Will the king grant Esther's request? Will the deliverance that Mordecai spoke of actually come? Esther fasted before she feasted with, king, with, uh, with the king and with Haman. And we have fasted long enough, waiting for the events to turn, uh, to the turn in the favour of our heroes. So now it's probably time for the entree. We're going to read chapter 6 and uh, Jen's going to come and read it to us. Yeah, getting exciting, isn't it? So chapter 6 for Esther. That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the, court, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, 
For the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman, get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led, led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall had started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. It really does seem like fate and random circumstance falls both ways, doesn't it? And how satisfying it is to us when we see an enemy humiliated. How many times have you wished that, uh, that you could come around that corner, that, that bend as you're driving, and see the car that zoomed past you only minutes earlier on the side of the road in front of the flashing blue lights? Now, how many times have you dreamed of that? See, Haman's humiliation kind of restores our hope uh, for a time in this story. We might even be tempted to say, about time. As if we expect fate to be even-handed. As if, like Mordecai, we expect deliverance to come at some point. But, but why? What drives us to expect deliverance for these Jews? I guess it depends on where we expect deliverance to come from. Now, the humiliation of Haman, it whets our appetite. Uh, and he's whisking away towards the, uh, to, the, to the second banquet with uh, Esther and Xerxes at the end. Gives us this ominous sign. The main course is being prepared. Now just as fate seemingly took Esther away to the king's harem, now it seems to be taking Haman away as well. And so another meal is prepared and the wine is served. And the king calls for Esther's request again. And this time, it comes in hot. Esther's words cut into the air and sober up this gluttonous king. And she says, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. The wine in Haman's mouth suddenly turns sour. The king demands to know who would dare to do this thing and Esther sums up the man and names him. An adversary and enemy. This vile Haman. And my guess is that the wine in Haman's mouth now sprays out into the air. He's cooked and he knows it. Begging Esther for his life only enrages the king all the more and Haman's now famous famous pole gets its first use and he is impaled well the tide has turned the circumstances now flow the other way and while the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be repealed more laws can be made to countermand the previous ones this time Xerxes lets Esther and Mordecai write and seal the laws with his own signet ring Laws that enable the Jews to defend themselves against their enemies when that day of Adar comes around, they do just that. And across the provinces, thousands upon thousands of their enemies are defeated. The story of Esther, it's a ripping tale and we, we just cannot do it justice uh, 
in our flyover this morning. It's a rich, rich story that I want to encourage you to read for yourselves a few times. There's so much more detail than we can possibly cover. But is it just a good story and not much more? There are big questions that get asked about this book all the time. Uh, right throughout the book, there was no mention of God. There were hints, of course, weren't there? I mean, Mordecai's certainty of deliverance from one place or another. Uh, Esther's fasting, that's kind of what you do uh, alongside prayer. But all of these are only small hints, aren't they? And few and far between. The thing about this story is it just does, it really does seem like a bunch of stuff that happens. And while we might make out the unseen hand in the background, uh, appealing, it, appealing to it to say, look, there's God uh, looking after his people. It just doesn't seem to cut it as a way of saying this book uh, has its place in the Bible. We expect more. Uh, we expect to see more. Outside of the Bible, if this, if this was just a story in isolation, this story about Esther and Mordecai and Xerxes and Haman, it is just a really cool story about a difficult time when the Jews got lucky and things worked out. Sure, Esther was brave, but people are often brave when their lives are threatened. But outside of the Bible, that's all that this is. It's just a cool story. But the fact is, this story is in our Bibles. The setting to this story is bigger than the 127 provinces of Xerxes. The setting of this story goes back well before the Persian Empire, well before the predecessors of the Persian Empire, Babylon. The setting of this story goes back to the foundation of the Jews back to the foundation of Israel, back to their ancestor Abraham, where promises were made to Abraham about, about uh, the people, indeed the nation, that would come from his own body and the body of his wife Sarah. Promises that through his family, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And through Abraham's family, kings would come. And they did come. The promises uh, were also made that a true eternal king would come and this king would rule far more than 127 provinces and his rule would never end that is the setting of this story that we find as we find it in the old testament and it's only within that setting only within those plans and promises that we can now discern the hidden hand of god in the story of esther where he works through the ways of men and women through the mess of this world through drunken orgies of narcissists through the evil objectives of hateful enemies and through the imperfect service of his own people he works through the toing and throwing of superpowers and the restless dilly-dallying of a sleepless king who wants to dull his mind by scrolling through his news feed he works through the grotesque perversions of sex by the ancient Persian customs. He works through the foolish maxims of the law of the Medes and the Persians. He works. God works in all these things, in all things, to keep his promises, to fulfill his promises, to deliver his people. God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Our world is so much like the world of Esther. As people, we experience the same things. We get pushed and pulled around in it, finding ourselves in the, in the place and parts of the fabric of this broken world. And we find ourselves struggling to know what to do, what to say, stuffing it up, making a mess, stepping up, being faithful, having a win from time to time, having a loss. It's all in a day's work for the Christian. Life is indeed a mysterious mixed bag of good and bad of victories and defeats and it can seem all so so random uh, so subject to chance and resigned to fate 
But you will only see God working, truly working, when you see the otherwise meaningless events of life through the lens of his plan and his promises. If you want to understand Esther's story, if you want to understand your story, then you have to place it in the right setting. The story of God's big plan for the salvation of his people. His ultimate plan was to bring about the birth of his son Jesus in Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, many, many years later, where that ordinary, where, where that ordinary looking kid born in unremarkable circumstances would be pushed and pulled around the land by the powers of his day. He would be in danger. He would flee to a distant country. He would return when it was safe. He would grow up in a small village, unknown and invisible, an ordinary unremarkable person mixed in with all the happenings of the world like everyone else but through the lens of the scriptures focused by the message of the gospel we see how god works in all the circumstances of life to bring about his ultimate plan and his people's ultimate good only when your perspective is sharpened and focused by what god has revealed that he is doing will you see him at work in the details of this world and in your own life. Only when you look through the gospel will you see the threat, the threat of God's law that means that means death to all who have sinned against him. And only through the gospel will you see the deliverance that has come through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Mordecai was confident that deliverance would come. From where or how, he didn't exactly know, just that it would come. We have so much more reason to be confident in our deliverance because we have seen Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal King, die for our judgment on a Roman cross and rise to life on the third day just as he promised. His plan now is to make us, his people, more like his Son, Jesus. And that might not look like the story you and I would write. It could look like the goings-on of this world is going against us sometimes. But only if this world is random, is, is random circumstance and arbitrary fate. But you see, stories like Esther's story in the setting of the Bible tell us that we have a God who is in control and working out his plan for his people and through his people and in and through his world under his sovereign control. Esther's story inspired the Jewish festival of Purim, a festival that celebrates that sorrow was turned to joy. It's a celebration of thanksgiving for deliverance. But it is, it's a name of the festival that ought to catch our attention. The text uh, in, the, in the last, or in the, in the chapter 9 of, uh, of Esther explains that the name Purim comes from the Babylonian word pur, which means the lot, uh, which means lot, the, uh, as in cast the lot, or dice, as in roll the dice. It was Haman who cast the lot. He rolled the dice to discover uh, fate's choice of the day uh, that he should slaughter the Jews. But fate failed Haman. And the name Purim is really a not-so-subtle dig at those who trust fate and chance who seek their deliverance by taking their chances, rather than the sovereign God who keeps his promises, the God who delivers. Jews like Mordecai knew that fate, chance, rolling the dice meant nothing. And he said, as he said, deliverance will come. He knew where it comes from, and so do we. Because when you know that God behind it all you know there is no random circumstance or arbitrary fate there is no chance no rolling of the dice there is the sovereign god of all creation he is the one who brings deliverance he is the one who saves he is the one in whom we should put our trust
You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information or download other resources, please visit our website at lmap.org.au.